Good morning. I want to thank the organizers of CEFI 2015 for accepting this paper for oral presentation. I also want to thank the Technical Review Committee of CEFI 2015 for its peer review of this paper. My critique of the peer review process does not extend to these fine individuals. This paper is about the failure of the engineering profession to consistently uphold the ideals of the peer review process in its publication. These ethical failures create risks to the credibility of engineers everywhere. We dedicate this paper to those that lost their lives on the morning of 11 September 2001, their surviving family members, and the workers who became ill as a result of their efforts at rescue and recovery. The views presented in this paper are those of the authors and may not reflect the views of CEFI 2015, the organizing committee members, the CEFI member institutions, and their sponsors. The engineering profession has the important role of bringing reality and credibility into public policy discussions. Historically, engineers have been held in high esteem with the array of challenges facing the world, such as global climate change and sustainability, the engineering profession must retain its the stature so it can help build tomorrow's world. The preamble to the National Society of Professional Engineers Code of Ethics says, engineering is an important and learned profession. As members of this profession, engineers are expected to exhibit the highest standards of honesty and integrity. Engineering must be de dedicated to the protection of the public health, safety, and welfare. Engineers must perform under a standard of of professional behavior that requires adherence to the highest principles of ethical conduct. This case study will discuss the reasons that many in the public are questioning the integrity of the engineering profession. Segments of the population in North America perceive engineering organizations and universities as having forfeit their role by implicitly supporting implausible assertions about physics and engineering related to the destruction of the World Trade Center skyscrapers. There are risks to the engineering profession that you may not be aware of. It is difficult to see credibility being lost. One day you, you may wake up and find that few trust you and your profession, and possibly you cannot understand why. Specific events can be a turning point. The silence of the engineering profession about the destruction of the World Trade Center has led many to question the ethics of the engineering profession. They see explanations that do not make sense. They see peer-reviewed papers with unsupportable explanations. They see that alternative hypotheses are not allowed to be published. Many other individuals within the profession are vocal, but their voices are not heard by the organizations that, quote, speak for engineers, close quote. They ask, why don't engineering societies and associations depend, demand accountability? Are their codes of ethics hollow rhetoric? On the morning of 11 September 2001, the Twin Towers suffered structural trauma followed by fires in less than two hours from the impact of the first aircraft, both steel frame structures were destroyed. That evening, the 47-story World Trade Center Building 7, which was not hit by an airplane, descended symmetrically under freefall acceleration for 32 meters in a manner indistinguishable from a classic controlled demolition, where all supporting columns are destroyed simultaneously with explosives. The following video clips will show the observable facts of the destruction of these three skyscrapers. The first will show the South Tower. What you should observe is that the material that has been ejected into the air, and which is in free fall, is possibly falling slower than the demolition wave that is proceeding down the building. In free fall, 100% of the potential energy of the mass is converted into kinetic energy at the fastest rate possible in Earth's gravity. If energy was expended in breaking up the structure, this would slow down the collapse and the debris would have obscured the view of the destruction of the subsequent stories. What we see here is the material that's been ejected outside the footprint and doesn't have time to fall down and obscure the view of the next floor that is being uh, subject to the ejections. This BBC video shows a side view of the North Tower where we can see the demolition wave ejecting material from the side of the structure. We can see it traveling down the face of the building as fast as, or faster than, the structural material in free fall. Other videos from a different angle show that this demolition wave is affecting only a small section of the center line.
This cannot be a gravity only collapse. So what we see is the building was standing nice and uh, steady and then it began its descent and now you can see the material being ejected out the side of the building keeping up with material that was in free fall. We'll see that again. It's nice and steady and now it starts to go down and here's the material being ejected out on the right hand side keeping up with material that's in free fall. This is the collapse of Building 7. The official explanation is that a small fire on the 13th floor initiated this collapse. It is indistinguishable from a planned controlled demolition. The observed freefall acceleration shows that the entire supporting structure suddenly offered zero resistance. You can see it coming down on the left in freefall acceleration. Sound engineering analysis should, at a minimum, conform to the basic rules of observation. As engineering students, we learn the following process to solve a physics problem. First, develop a hypothesis. This hypothesis can be informed by the initial and final states of the problem. From this, we can estimate the forces that are present. Then we draw free body diagrams and write the relevant equations. Once we complete the analysis or perform the simulation, we are taught to quantify how closely the simulation matches the observation. If results do not match the observations, we are taught to revise the problem formulation or, or hypothesis. More equations cannot fix a flawed hypothesis. This illustration shows a free body diagram for a block that is subject to the vertical forces of gravity and the horizontal forces of wind. In the free body diagram on the left, the wind is negligible and the block falls straight down. In the diagram on the right, the wind is much greater and the block is blown to the right. Given specific dimensions, the force vector of the wind can be calculated. If the block were observed to have been blown to the right, it is clear that a horizontal force such as wind was present. The reputation of the engineering profession has been harmed by the apparent failure of the peer review process in important journals. Professor Z.P. Bazant, a member of the civil engineering faculty at Northwestern University, wrote several papers, one as early as September 13, 2001, which is just two days after the event and before the smoke cleared. Even though his hypothesis has been the subject of a great deal of professional disagreement, no, S no ASCE journal has allowed any significant critique. As a foundational concept, if observations do not match the theoretical framework, then a reassessment of the hypothesis is necessary. Formulas and equations that do not represent the problem under investigation are irrelevant. This slide shows Bazant's hypothesized model illustrating how the top part of a tower labeled as block C, which is structurally aligned, started at rest, accelerated downward, crushing through the undamaged stronger structure labeled A in what, in what the authors call the crush down phase without inflicting equal or greater damage to block C itself. However, once block C reaches the bottom and encounters additional resistance, the crush-up phase then destroys the previously indestructible block C. A defined rubble pile within the footprint of the tower is a necessary outcome. This is a photo taken from a police helicopter that has been available for many years. It is not possible to see any portion of an intact structure resembling block C. From this photo, you can see that material is being ejected perpendicular to gravity in all directions. From this single photograph, Bazant's hypothesis about block C and the mechanism of destruction is invalidated. For the authors and reviewers of Bazant's paper to have accepted the hypothesized mechanism without reviewing the wealth of photographic evidence demonstrates that the peer review process was flawed, and from the public's perspective, this discredits the engineering profession by extension. This slide taken from the FEMA report documents FEMA's assessment that material was ejected into two symmetric 370 meter diameter debris fields centered around each of the towers. As you will see, estimates suggesting that 90% or more of the mass of the buildings was ejected outside the footprint are credible. For the North Tower, you will see that this percentage could be nearly 100% of the mass. This would not have been predicted under Bazant's crush down or crush up hypothesis. 
Comparing the hypothesized rubble pile on the left with the rubble pile that is observed on the right, you can see that Bazant's rubble pile is not consistent with the debris field in the FEMA report. Comparing the photograph of the post-destruction lobby area of the North Tower with Bazant's hypothesized rubble pile on the left, you can see that the rubble pile is not consistent with his hypothesis. The next two slides will show you additional details that would have been available to the peer reviewers. The absence of a significant rubble pile is an inherent part of the survival story of a dozen members of the Fire Department of New York who were trapped in the fourth floor stairwells when the building was destroyed. After the destruction, when the smoke cleared, they looked up and saw, quote, a beautiful blue sky above us, close quote, not the bottom of 106 stories of pancaked rubble. The rubble pile hypothesized by Bazant simply did not exist. This close-up of the lobby area shows the central columns rising above the lobby floor of the North Tower. They are at the center, inside the surviving east and north perimeter walls. Virtually none of the mass of the North Tower is within this footprint. The source of the horizontal forces that ejected the material outside the footprint of the building is not exactly known. However, there is evidence of highly energetic materials whose presence cannot be explained. Investigators found iron-rich microspheres in the WTC dust. Formation of iron microspheres requires temperatures much higher than burning jet fuel or office materials. These spheres were so unusual that they were used as a marker to determine if a sample was WTC dust or not. Independent scientists found red-gray chips in the dust that were determined to contain unreacted thermitic material. These chips were tested and shown to have explosive and incendiary properties, with the primary reaction byproduct being molten iron. This molten iron would solidify into iron-rich microspheres, which if dispersed during an energetic reaction, would create these spheres. This process was confirmed by experiments. One analysis of the World Trade Center disaster puts the, the investigation into this historical context. The disaster investigation, far from proving itself a dispassionate scientific verdict on causality and blame, actually emerges as a hard-fought contest to define the moment in politics and society, in technology and culture. The credibility and stature of the engineering profession to help build tomorrow's world may be severely weakened by the current state of this hard-fought contest if it remains uncorrected. Engineers are needed for the challenges ahead. Engineers need to lead the way on climate change and sustainability. To be effective, the public must regard engineering as an ethical profession. In the future, engineers may wonder, why don't they trust us? This paper outlined risks to the credibility of the engineering profession. The Professional Engineering Society is endorsing, explicitly or tacitly, the fraudulent explanation of a gravity-only collapse are leading to more young people asking, quote, why don't the engineers say something? A, a 2013 survey taken in the U.S. shows that 24% of those sampled in the age range of 18 to 24 years old agreed with the explosive demolition of the Twin Towers. This is the age range of most of your engineering students. Thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions now or by email. Thank you very much.